Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the official Oscarina nomination coverage for Dragon Quest V. Dragon Quest V is a role-playing game developed by Chunsoft and published by Enix. It was originally a Japan-only title from 1992, and wouldn't be available for Western audience until it was remastered for the Nintendo DS in 2009. The version you are seeing here is a fan translation of the game done by DJAP Translations and Partial Translations. Fans of the series from back in the day would know the Dragon Quest games by the title Dragon Warrior, a change made to avoid potential copyright with a tabletop game with the same name. The first four entries into the series are all available on the Nintendo Entertainment System, making Dragon Quest V the first entry to be released on the Super Nintendo. Evidently, programming issues prevented Dragon Quest V from getting an English release, which is a shame because the game tells an epic coming-of-age tale in which you progress from being a little toddler all the way into adulthood and through all the harrowing events that ensue along the way. My name is Mitchell and I'll be your host for the evening, and here with me is fellow voter Corbett. Corbett, thanks for coming along. Thank you for hosting me. Glad to be here. Dragon Quest V earned a coincidental five nominations, and they are for Best Pixel, 1992, Best Direction, Best Gameplay, Fellowship, and Relaxation, Best Male Character for Papas, and Best Narrative Composition. So, uh, to kind of kick things off, we should probably give a little bit of our background on our experiences with the game. So I played an ambiguous amount of this game. <laughs> I say ambiguous Are you just trying to avoid <laughs> being shamed by all of the voters or all the people watching? Well, it's, no, it's more like I just don't know. It could have been he played 99% of the game, guys. You don't know. <laughs> well, I'm getting to the actual timestamp. It's just confusing because in the comparative Lex Let's Play you were looking at, it looked like I had gotten about 40% of the way through. But when I'm looking at the Dragon Quest V script, which is just like the story beats, then I'm much further. I'm like a good, I don't know, 80-ish percent. So it's very hard to tell because like the story bits, and we're going to talk about this later on when we get into it, but the story is concentrated a lot in the early half of the game. And then in the latter half, the dungeons get really long. And so that takes up a tremendous amount of the runtime. Yeah, that seems fair. Uh, so what about for you? Did you watch a full Let's Play or how did that look? Yeah, so I did in fact watch a full Let's Play, although when there were like extended dungeon segments and I had watched enough to get a feel for the dungeon, I would fast forward until the next significant boss yeah. or you know story event happened. So it's not like I sat through the whole thing. Uh, and for me, um, because there weren't any Let's Plays of, the er of Dragon Quest V for SNES, which also had people reading out all the text out loud with decent voice acting. Um, I found a higher quality Let's Play for the Nintendo DS remaster of Dragon Quest V. So that's one I did my uh, Let's Play with. That might potentially give me a somewhat distorted view of the game because I know that the Dragon Quest V remaster added a lot more you know, story content in the form of Party Talk, for example, and it may have made other changes yeah. as well. But to the extent possible, I'm going to try to use my uh, Dragon Quest V Let's Play for the DS in order to approximate, you know, what the experience would have been like on the SNES. Yeah, yeah, because I played the Super Nintendo version, that's the footage you're seeing here with the translation, but even if I needed help figuring out where to go, which happened maybe two or three times, it, it was very hard to find any kind of help. I had to, like, shift through walkthroughs that tended to be a little more applicable because finding someone to just do a playthrough of the Super Nintendo version on YouTube in English was is basically non-existent. I did find a channel, but he just spent so much time sort of repeating things or going back, and it looked like he was confused on numerous occasions, so he was dragging out the runtime. It wasn't like a clean playthrough, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess that that's, that's to give us a background. I mean, for the record, too, Neither Corbett nor I are big RPG fans, specifically for just super, super lengthy games like this. So it's like 30 hours if you're playing the DS version. And I mean, by golly, you're going to feel it because, you know, it's the very traditional turn based random encounters, hit attack, deal damage, etc. And you do that for, you know, about a, about 45 minutes until something exciting happens and the story actually kicks into gear once more so yeah but we did our best 
and uh, we both, well, I like the game. I shouldn't say we both. <laughs> These are mostly my nominations, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like parts of the game, and I mean, I can recognize some of the cool things it was doing. Part of it might just be that it's not my genre. I mean, this, for one, this is the first Dragon Quest game I've played, but for two, I mean, I'm very concerned about my awesome per second in games, whereas JRPGs of the time had as a selling point the fact that they can go on for very long periods of time. And for me, there are times where I can enjoy a very long game. I mean, right now I'm playing Library of Ruina, which is a 100 plus hour game and I'm loving it, but it's That's... really got to do a lot to justify and earn that yeah. attention for me. Whereas I didn't feel like Dragon Quest V did enough of that. But at the same time though, despite that, I would still say that Dragon Quest V did a number of interesting things and I can see why people, you know, a lot of people consider it their favorite Dragon Quest or even some considering it their favorite game of all time. Yeah, and I will say as a final kind of note before we get into it is that I didn't obviously play this one when I was growing up, but I did play the original Dragon Warrior on NES. I still have that game. Um, and I did play Dragon Quest II on the Game Boy Color. So I was somewhat familiar with both of them. I never actually beat either one because they're just really long and especially the, especially the first one is just a massive grind. And there is a kind of relaxation to that, which you know we'll talk about when we get there. But um, yeah, that's kind of where my background is with it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, best male character then. I think we're going to start with that. And uh, we'll talk about Papa's. So Papa's presence fundamentally alters the experience because it turns the limited visuals into meaningful story significance. You have a father. A papa, and your father protects you, looks after you, and lets you play when time provides. He's a warm, protective guardian that eases the player into a balance of safety and free-spirited adventure. Furthermore, he quite literally walks you through the early stages of childhood, but does not handhold. And so from a gameplay perspective, having a character in-game serve as a tutorial that doesn't do any tutorializing and instead just behaves like a father so the player can feel secure is a bit of genius, really. There's one quote that he had, the act one, that I think summarized it kind of well. You know, he says, After we finish this journey, I plan for us to settle down for a while. I know that it must have been rough and lonely for you till now, but I plan to make it up to you after this. So, clearly shows his care he has for his son and his desire to empathize with him and look out for him and such. So, overall, good dad. Um, I also appreciate the fact that while he tells his kid to be careful and watch out for danger, he doesn't excessively shelter him. He gives his kid opportunities to be independent when he tells him to just, you know, play with himself or run around town. Uh, and he does have his child batter monsters, but he heals them after the battle, such that the kid is able to face measured amounts of danger himself and learn accordingly. So doing a good job of raising his kid to be a very capable adventurer like himself, which is nice. As an Act 1 spoiler, I thought that another moment that Papas really shows how much of a good daddy is, is when he chooses unhesitatingly to die slowly and stoically to boss minions that he had handily defeated earlier <laughs> for the sake of protecting his son. You'll you'll find out about it when you get there, but the fact that he just, you know, after you've just seen him wreck these monsters and just sits there taking the damage is pretty great storytelling and just goes to show you how much of a amazing protective and self official dad that he is so i thought that was also pretty neat yeah yeah he, i mean he represents the mentor figure in the hero's journey right but he's also like a semblance of home that can never be reclaimed after his death and so there's a bit of like genuine melancholy and grief when that moment hits there are all sorts of tender moments with him actually like the part where he gets distracted from a conversation and starts walking backwards only to realize this and then course correct uh, it's such a human moment that doesn't add to the gameplay or the larger narrative, but it's one of the many ways in which the game communicates that it has a soul. For sure. I would also say that, aside from Pankraz being a great dad, he also is shown to be a great community figure where everyone in town likes and respects him. There's one moment where Papas is about to leave the town and someone tells him, Oh, Papas, don't go home after just a few hours. Why don't you stay over, at least for the night? And Papas replies with, Oh, all right, how can I say no to such good friends? So, you know, it seems like he's used to this kind of hospitality because everyone in the town loves him so much. And then there was another time where you're about to leave the village with Papas, and he tells you, We should start heading back to the village now. Have you said goodbye to everyone in the city yet? So 
he's training you to be a great community member like himself and as being such a good community member he thinks you should say goodbye to each and every person so that you can forge meaningful relationships with them which is also pretty great i kind of like that too because it's a fairly typical phrase that you would hear in an rpg but given here it's filtered through a particular character who has a specific role in the story that adds that extra meaningful weight that you're extrapolating from it so yeah i thought it was really clever sure and i also think that it would be like a typical phrase in an rpg to say like oh have you said goodbye to your friends yet or have you said goodbye to the meaningful npc in the city yet but he's like have you said goodbye to everyone in the city yet like oh that's just the <laughs> thing you do you know you just go to yeah. every single person in town and say goodbye which you know goes to show how much of a chad above and beyond dad he is in <laughs> terms of he even goes above and beyond with his relationship building which is kind of cool yeah so another example where Papas is able to um, shine is when he's willing to tolerate Prince Henry being mischievous and disrespectful towards him. But there is a moment in the story where he actually smacks Prince Henry, the child, but it's with a fairly large amount of importance. Uh, so the exact quote is, well, whatever, I don't plan on returning to that castle anyhow. My brother can take the stupid throne. No one cares about me anyhow. Then he, Prince Henry, smack. You slapped me? Ugh, how dare you? Your Highness, did you ever stop to think about how your father would take this? Your father, he, and then he just trails off. So in this moment, smacking Prince Henry hammers home not only how his father cares about him, it also protects Henry from putting himself in danger stupidly because he'd rather stay in a cave full of monsters than, you know, go back to his safe home. Um, mm -hmm. But it also teaches Prince Henry not to hurt his father's feelings because I'm sure that if he returned home and told the dad, oh yeah, sorry, your, your kid hates you so much he'd rather put himself in moral peril than be with you, it would devastate him. So the fact mm -hmm. that Pancras, you know, actually is willing to send out some discipline when it really matters. I mean, I don't know if I necessarily condone physical violence on kids, but I would say <laughs> that at least as far as really hammering, hammering home something important, this is a good moment to do so for Pancras and shows how he has you know, not only self-restraint, but also, you know, assertiveness when it really matters. Yeah, but I, I, I like that he slapped Henry specifically because Henry is royalty and he's a kid. He, this could come down on him pretty bad if anyone ever found out, but he's not above that because, you know, Henry is being a brat and he's we're only in this mess because he was being rebellious. So you know, he's doing a disciplinary action to set things straight, and so there's the moral compass of his character comes through. Yeah, sure, that's a good way of putting it, I would say. Another thing I was going to mention about Papas is that he is incredibly strong and hinted numerous times at being an accomplished adventurer with many deeds. Um, when you have him as a party member, he does ridiculous damage amounts, takes very little <laughs> damage, and he heals you at the end of every battle. So... He comes across as this crazy high-level adventurer when you can't even fathom it, and you're just dealing out these itty-bitty little pieces of damage to the slime. There's also a scene where he busts a uh, certain character out of prison, but when he does so, he rips the prison door off of the prison <laughs> cell and throws it off the screen. Like, I thought that was just awesome. Like, when you're totally yeah. not expecting it either, it's just like <laughs> putting in this old school standard JRPG stuff, and then all of a sudden, boom, there goes the door. It's like, whoa, that's so cool. Um, yeah, small things like that become so much more noticeable when everything else is just bare bones aesthetically. Mm-hmm. And yeah, both for his accomplishments as an adventurer, but also being a great father figure, um, he ends up acting as a role model for you to aspire to be like throughout your character's journey, you know, and life during the game. He ends up, you know, you want to try and follow his suit at being a good family man, a community figure, and a hero for the world at large. So it kind of, even when he's not present in the game, it's sort of like his shadow still sort of lingers over you as you kind of think about how, you know, your character is trying to live up to this mountain of a man. He very much serves a number of very specific roles. He's your emotional connection to the story and the game. He's your tutorial to the mechanics. He's uh, also an important character in the larger scope of the narrative. So he does a lot of legwork, even though his on-screen presence is mostly limited to Act 1. 
So yeah, he's he's a great character. There were a couple characters I actually considered putting down, but Popeyes was the one that I was absolutely uncompromising on. I was like, we we've got to get him in there. He's he's such a definitive part of Dragon Quest V, and it really does. And I'm going to talk about this more when we get into narrative and direction, but he really serves an important role in reshaping the Dragon Quest formula because typically you're some kind of knight or royalty and you go off on a quest and it's all very expected but here you're kind of a nobody or at least you think you're a no one when the story begins and so you're just journeying with your dad you're just going on off on hiking trips and you're doing things like slaying monsters but also meeting up with people who are important to your you know extended family uh, or meeting up with people who are important to Papa's or people from his past. And so there's this kind of... It, it, it's a very low stakes beginning to the game. And I actually really like that because it's a sort of small beginnings type of theme. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I actually think that um, that might be in part why I'm not as keen on like Prophecy or Chosen One type things. Is that like here, you're not a adventurer because, well, that's just your destiny. That's the thing to do. You're an adventurer by choice because you're trying to, yeah. you know, be cool like your dad and stuff like that. And it sort of, you know, lends more weight to being an adventurer as a decision and not just what's expected of you and stuff like that, which is, you know, adds some extra gravitas to your actions, I would say. Yeah, and I think that's going to segue us nicely into the narrative composition and to kind of kick things off. Some of the other characters, they just have a few points to make um, in terms of the quality of their characterization, I think is relevant. So Henry is that spoiled brat, uh, but he becomes a dignified individual. Uh, moreover, he's a somewhat generic character, I felt, who undergoes an arc, and I'd venture to say he's the only one in the story to really have this. A lot of the other characters are fairly stagnant. Um, they're hinted to be, you know, more developed, but we don't actually get to see the transformation. Even when he has more than earned the right to sit on the throne, so with Henry, you know, later on in the story, after he's been a slave, after he's suffered, you know, after he's more than earned the right to take up the throne, he relinquishes that right for his stepbrother. And also he marries a slave girl, which is not something a royal is supposed to do, but it goes to show that he bonded with her over their shared suffering such that it is more important to him. And so I thought he was a pretty good character. The other one I really liked is Bianca. She's your typical tomboy who eventually develops affection for the protagonist. She even goes out of her way to help you pass a trial in order to wed a wealthy daughter, much to her own dismay. But she isn't pompous or selfish about it, and her affection isn't entirely arbitrary either. She's your childhood friend, and as children there's no talk of romance. But you get along and get into trouble. And then many years later, when you reunite, you have the option of marrying her instead. And so it's a nice, uh, tender story. Um, you know, this as a is... quick aside, by the way, I'm glad that you happen to spotlight Bianca as opposed to the less best wives, or else we'd have fighting <laughs> words. You know, just saying. Yeah, oh yeah, no, it had to be Bianca. She's the one you have history with. No other. Uh huh. Yeah, I, it was weird how two people online were saying, "Oh, like pick the other girl because like of whatever uh, mechanical benefit you get." I'm like, I'm not marrying her. I don't even know her. Like, <laughs> why would I be with her? That makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just misconception online. There's like a choice of wife in this game, but no, no, they're all just wrong. There's, there's really no choice. It's, it's just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, because I mean, so, and then getting into our narrative then, it's the total embodiment of a full adventure-filled life. And it doesn't shy away from the emotional significance of the events and even captures them surprisingly well. Act 1, for example, beautifully represents childhood by simply letting the player be a child in the way that children are quickly disinterested with adults and prioritize their own amusement. The adults drag you around while they busy themselves with uninteresting things that don't make sense to us yet. Meanwhile, you occupy yourself with making friends and populating your world with imagination, curiosity, and discovery. Yeah, sure. I would say that the kind of adventures that you go on during Act 1, they're colorful and entertaining in their own right, and they also give you the option to bond with Bianca, which is nice. But I really appreciate that all of the adventures you're going on during Act 1 also embody the sort of things that kids do or they wish they could do. So you explore a haunted mansion, you explore a creepy cave, both of which with your childhood friend. Um, you end up visiting the land of the fairies, which, you know, 
appears to be something of a daydream, you know, as far as a imaginary adventure. And you even get to help your epic dad out on one of his adventures and have him recognize how much you've grown. That's just the sort of thing that an aspirational kid would love to participate in. So I thought that it was neat that you uh, get to do those sort of things during Act One, you know, in a very kid like fashion. Yeah, it's such a tonal clash with the past games where they just commission you to go out and save a princess and save the land, blah, blah, blah. And that stuff starts to ring hollow when done ad nauseum. And so this really makes the focus about you. And it makes you be a very, very small child. And that just completely reshapes this whole game. It's a real sweeping generational epic that spares no expense to walk you through all the memorable moments of a full lived life. Growing up through the course of a game is actually quite rare, but games provide a great synergy as a medium for this type of story, namely as an RPG with gameplay downtime that mirrors in some, in small and subtle ways the passing of time. For example, when you free the fairies in the dreamland as a child, it's full of details that basically don't matter to anyone ever. All it is is a daydream you have, and yet what a novel way to capture the imagination of childhood. And this isn't an easy story to tell either because not only is the aesthetic cute and vulnerable to dismissal, but the language of its characters is built to match that image and somehow does not limit itself into a for children trap that so many games fall victim to. Who doesn't relate to having a daydream or working hard in your adolescence at a soul sucking job or being unable to sleep at night stressing over if you can, should and could end up marrying the person of your dreams. Being sold as a slave uh, is another big highlight in this story because it's not only a good narrative arc to put the player through, but it is also something that is believable for a high fantasy time period. Even though it's not reflective of an exact period in history, the, the choice alone of a real world historical event that has happened in many countries and cultures around the world is just one example that helps sell its pixelated representation of real life. And so, you know, the surface of what this game looks like is a kind of misleading because there's just really so much depth here about how conscientious it is about human nature, uh, thoughtfulness, and you know these kind of historical events that take place as well. Yeah, I mean, I do think that like you know these RPGs are expected to be like you know many tens of hours long, and so it's nice as a choice of subject matter that Dragon Quest V wanted to tell the story of someone's entire life you know that is one of those stories that's like hard to put in something that's not really long and so it's nice that they're taking advantage of that long run time to sort of you know get that kind of generational storytelling so overall i would say that my general take on the narrative of dragon quest 5 is that it's trying to make the statement that suffering in your life will be worth it because you will have good moments and leave a good legacy which will make up for the bad moments. This is admirable in a way because, like for me, that was a strong statement that the author was making through the course of the narrative. It doesn't resonate with me as strongly since I tend to focus on overcoming suffering more by extracting meaning and strength through those adverse circumstances. But nevertheless, it's an understandable viewpoint on life to have. And for the people who do share that sort of viewpoint, I can really see how it would, you know, hit home for them fairly well. Um, just to elaborate a bit more on, you know, sort of the general reason why I sort of think that is that like Dragon Quest V will have certain traumatic events, but then afterwards it just kind of moves on and doesn't really comment on it very much afterwards, which is on in line with the idea of moving on from your suffering. It's just like, yeah, that thing sucked. Let's move on and focus on better things you're going to have in your life afterwards. So it's kind of interesting in that way. Just to sort of uh, give you one example of where this sort of plays out, um, end of Act 2 spoilers, um, there's a section in the game where you fail to defeat this adversary and you turn into a statue and get to watch as, you know, the world, you know, your wife gets carted off and the world gets worse because they don't have their hero anymore. And well, because she's turned into his statue as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the two of you are and, petrified and then you get sold away. So, uh, I mean, this is different than the slavery scenario. That's just with you. But then the second one is after you're both kind of heroes, then yeah, you failed to defeat the adversary and then you're petrified and then sold into different yeah. uh, vendors. 
Yeah, so this cutscene is pretty lengthy, and they give you a long yeah. time to really, you know, sit there and watch as the world suffers and goes downhill without a hero, which really sells just how much of a loss you incurred when you became imprisoned. And when you were out, it helps you realize all the more how important the role of you, the hero, or, and your son, the future hero, really is. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this horrible circumstance that you went through, I mean, at least the impression I got was that it's not really your fault. There's not really that much you could have done to prevent it. It's more just to show that life really sucks at times, which is sort of in line with my interpretation of the game's intended meaning. It's not really about, like, you know, how this really terrible suffering in your life meant that, you know, you should have done this, or, you know, it means that the villain is characterized by this particular nuanced motivation. It's just, man, life really sucks, but you know what? You got other good moments, too, that'll make up for it. So it's all right, you know? So mm-hmm. kind of interesting how they, you know, go about it in that way. And then other than that, another point I had to mention about the narrative that I think was kind of cool is that... It's neat that the game gives you a chance right before the end credits roll to revisit all the towns you went to during your adventure. All the NPCs say new stuff, and while you're revisiting them, you can reminisce on your adventures, which is, you know, a nice way to sort of realize the impact that you made in all these people's lives and, you know, what a grand adventure you truly had. And what's more, you know, while other video games tend to usually play this as just a montage while the credits roll, this is interactive. I mean, it's not actually rolling the credits but like it feels like this is the end credits roll where you're going around from town to town and you know Mm -hmm. seeing everyone one last time and stuff so so that also sort of takes advantage of the gaming medium to sort of give you a end credits montage to make it interactive and you know more involved than just seeing it all played by so that was also kind of neat so while i do think that the story is relatable I don't feel like it had as much to comment on the experiences and really like say something about being a child husband and a dad, which for me limits some of the game's narrative potential. I sort of think that like, you know, while you're going through these segments of your life, they really could have honed in on a specific message. But as is, you know, it's still got its benefits because it's making it more universally relatable, which is nice. And also for me, I wasn't as keen on the story in Act 3 as much. And Act 3 takes up over half the runtime because, as Mitch mentioned, there's a lot of really long dungeons in that part. But that being said, though, mm-hmm. you know, Act 1 was solid and parts of Act 2 were solid as well. So, you know, that's more of a Act 3 issue for me personally. And that's about all I had to say about uh, Best Narrative. I can see where you're coming from, where the story doesn't leave a kind of solidified point with uh, its material. But... I kind of preferred it that way. I think if it had tried to, you know, elaborate on some moralistic message, it would have been either preachy or it would have felt out of place. I mean, yes, the characters are slaves, but I don't really expect that to be a a, a longer subject of conversation for the story afterwards, or certainly not. You know, it's not like you're going to see the characters, you know, going through therapy afterwards. That's just not the kind of scenario that we have and for me i took the story in broad strokes and so it's not so much trying to do an authentic recreation of you know a slave narrative or a um you know hero narrative or husband narrative or whatever you want to call it or refer to but more that it's impactful just to touch upon all of these different life events um And there's sort of an equivalency here where you'll do things as a kid, like rescue some fairies, even though it's seemingly just in your imagination when that happens. Or you go and, you know, bust up some ghosts in a castle with a friend of yours, and no one really is that aware that this happens or why it matters. It's sort of irrelevant. But it's just a nice moment, a little bit of troublemaking that you get into with a friend. So these are like low stakes events that you do that are meant to remind you of the kind of trouble that you would get into, the kind of mischief you would get into as a kid yourself. And so in that way, it's making a projection and it's calling to mind certain memories or experiences that you've had. It reminds me a lot of something like The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Not at all in terms of subject matter, really, but just that 
there's a number of sequences in there where you kind of think to yourself, oh, this could be longer, this could give us more detail about their personal life or whatever, but there's just not going to be room for that because it would then start to get us too invested in these smaller moments. And really, the investment needs to be on this larger subject of someone's entire life. And so for me, that landed perfectly, and I thought that was, in many ways, actually more difficult to write. Because generally, you're going to frame your story around your MacGuffins, your plot points, your twists and turns. And this does that also. There does seem to be like room to expand on these things, especially if we're going to compare with how much time is spent just hacking away monsters and walking around. But at the same time, I also don't hold it too much against it because I personally felt like it was it was conveying that, you know, larger than life narrative really well. Mm hmm. Yeah, I guess maybe to a certain extent, it's like a mood piece, I guess, where it's like trying to like, you know, mm -hmm. put you in a certain moment and make you feel like that. And then maybe you have your own, you know, experiences you're going to relate to the game and sort of I could see people maybe finding like use and meaning in that in and of itself and whatnot, you know? I think that maybe yeah. it's just, I don't have an elaborate enough imagination, so maybe I need my <laughs> games to be me a little more prompting of being like, hey, hey, think about this, <laughs> you know? Or something like yeah. that. Or, but I don't know though. It could just be yeah, a difference in fair reference and stuff like that. I'm actually gonna take us into best direction now because I'm gonna, at the end, have kind of a mini essay, really, um, with some extended thoughts that's gonna put everything into perspective, I hope. But, uh, so let's table our narrative comp uh, discussion for now. We'll talk about direction. So in terms of the direction, here are the kind of overarching themes I want you to think about before I kind of go off on a spiel that is yet to come. So it's pretty much a lack of innovation uh, when it comes to gameplay, art, graphics, music, and really everything with regards to video games. Uh, in some sense though, this can be seen as an advantage, which I think it is. Rather than push the medium forward through design, the game scales way back, favoring its primitive tradition instead, at once preserving the past while paving the way for a grand epic story. So the game's bare-bones approach to its design causes it to become laser-focused on the spirit of its intentions. When you find your pet, and Bianca names it, for example, with help from your opinion, that is, uh, that's it, end scene, so little is said. You go back to repeatedly mashing the A button to clear hordes of enemies until the next meaningful moment. And while you're in this pastime, you reflect on what it means to have a pet, when the animal is taken from you, turned feral, and eventually reunited in the future. It makes up a small portion of the actual runtime, and the empty space in between is there for you to notice those story beats with greater importance. Not everyone will appreciate that style, but it is clearly a choice, and it works for what it wants to do. The prior Dragon Quest games all feature that, you know, hardy protagonist, some knightly hero who goes off and does great deeds. When Dragon Quest V opens, its graphical and gameplay presentation is basically untouched except now you're not the hero. You don't even exist yet. Instead, you are born and begin your journey as a six-year-old, your baby memories wiped as it is for all of us. The predictable and minimalistic direction disarms you, subverting the heroism. In other words, because everything appears so unremarkable, the only thing we can remark on is the heart of its narrative essence, which is arguably the only thing that has been properly and thoroughly overhauled. And for the better, the monster slain is no longer the subject of interest like it was before. And mind you, it was the interest in the original Dragon Quest or Dragon Warrior, because there's so little narrative in that game, you're just hacking through monsters. And instead, here you have a Super Nintendo game, and it should look a lot better, but it's pretty much graphically almost on equivalent playing field with an NES game. But in its place, the story is full of life, and the battles are not only blockades to progress, but a method to slow the pace of the game down and create meaningful breathing room between each noteworthy era of life. And you know, there's some other little touches here and there. For example, you've got a day and night cycle, and that provides interesting changes to towns, NPC dialogue, inns, etc. Um, and throughout all this, a sincere portrayal of childhood into adulthood really comes through. Ghost busting or saving a fairy queen are really surreal sequences and elegantly capture your sense of childhood wonder and adventure better than many other games, I would argue. 
and it must accomplish this through its narrative because the visuals and gameplay are nothing special. The mere act of playing the game is to revisit better days, given that it is so familiar to its roots, allowing you to experience a retro game even before it was called retro. And this goes some way to excuse that dated design. Uh, before we get into the big spiel though, I figured I would chip in my own thoughts on what the game does cool in the area of direction. Um, so for one thing, I thought that it was neat that the game had a full 20 minutes before they actually put you in a battle. It helps really hammer in the idea that as a kid, your intended and expected role is to be chilling around town while your beefy dad is out doing the important and dangerous stuff. When you actually do get into a battle, it's sort of more of a, oh wow, six-year-old's actually having a battle and stuff like that because of the fact that like, you know, it really hammers home the idea that you're a six-year-old, you're meant to, you know, go walk around the ship and break some barrels and talk to people. So that was kind of neat. Um, another thing I thought was really cool in terms of direction. So this is spoilers, but we already kind of covered it earlier. Um, so the game spends a good while on the slavery section where it seems like you have no escape and you are just stuck performing slave labor. In the end, you are saved only by the random kindness of a guard who probably perishes trying to help you out. This really hammers home how hopeless this situation is for so many others and how lucky you are to have escaped it. And having that backdrop of intense suffering for your character helps you role play as somebody who's trying to cherish life for all it's worth to enjoy the freedom that so many others couldn't achieve. You don't get the chance to do anything about that slavery until late in the game. Until then, you're just doing your own thing and living your life to the fullest. And that's sort of in line with what I was mentioning earlier, where, yeah, you know what? You got these really bad things that happen to you in life, but, you know, mm -hmm. you can just focus on having these good moments in life afterwards. And, you know, at the end of the day, you'll have a life worth living and such. So another bit of cool gameplay narrative synergy that sort of shows cool direction for Dragon Quest is that during the slavery sequence, you're locked into a room with a bunch of bug beds. Now, just prior to this in the game, you went through the adventure of rescuing the fairies and you were granted the ability to pick locks, but it only works sometimes, according to what the fairies say. So you're staring every night at this locked door and you're not able to unlock it. And it really just makes you, the player, wonder, wait, was all that stuff that I had just a dream? Was that just a lie? And by extension, you kind of wonder if your entire childhood was just inconsequential and meaningless because it doesn't even remotely match up with the reality that you're encountering now but later on spoilers for act three um <laughs> you end up discovering that the fairyland does really exist and because you had that background with the fairies um it lets you go there and do a step that's required to save the world and you even have a pleasant experience with your own child where he's able to experience the fairies in a way that you did when you were a kid in a way, by having the game put the fairyland again in Act 3, it's the game confirming that your childhood experiences were meaningful and do have relevance to life as a whole, even if it didn't save you during your darkest moments. That being said though, I personally would have preferred the story if they had just left the fairyland as purely imaginary, because it would have commented a bit more on the kinds of imagination that kids have. But I think that there is some degree of merit to be had for actually having the fairyland be real later on for the reasons that I mentioned. I also agree with you that it would have been better probably left as imaginary because I like the theme that I get from that. But at the same time, because it isn't, it's more narratively consistent instead of just being random noise, right? Like there's a per like you have to experience the fairy world in advance because then later on you revisit it and there's more plot stuff that happens with it and if it came out of left field later then it would have been weird so i can sympathize with them feeling like well we introduce it now and then develop it later but yes i also agree that so i mean we're torn i think is what i'm saying that both of us are kind of mixed on this particular aspect of it yeah i mean i think i might have preferred it a bit more if it was imaginary but there's definitely merits to what it's got right now so yeah as far as direction cons Personally, I didn't feel like the adventures that you're going on as a husband and as a parent really channeled the feeling of those moments in your life in the same way that the adventures of Act 1 channeled the feeling of being a kid. I mean, granted, you are, you know, going on a honeymoon, but, like, the kind of dungeons that you're exploring on your honeymoon aren't, like, 
super honeymoony. And mind you, that might have been kind of difficult to pull off in a realistic fashion, but it's a fantasy. They can kind of, I feel like they could have played looser with the trope in the interest of having a more atmospheric, you know, uh, and fitting adventure. But that might just be me personally, you know. Um, and then as a separate con, the game has you traveling with recruited monsters for a good chunk of the game. But befriending monsters isn't really a centerpiece of the plot, so the game misses out on some potential for gameplay storytelling when you are traveling and fighting with your monster party. Plus, the monster party's members being there also mean that you're not spending that time bonding with human party members who are more consequential to the plot. That being said, though, this game did come out before Pokemon, and Pokemon remedied this by, you know, having the storyline really center a bit more on the monsters. So yeah. it's hard to fault it for something, you know, when the gameplay narrative synergy with monster collecting hadn't really been established fully yet. Yeah, I mean, this is more like a, it's a spark of inspiration. It's innovative, but it's not quite using it to the fullest yet. I, I agree, it is sort of an awkward inclusion, and I personally didn't care for it. I I don't know, I, monster catching in Dragon Quest. I mean, there's actually a spinoff series of monster uh, what is it, Dragon Quest, or is it Monster Quest? I don't remember what it's called, but it's a series of Dragon Quest games that lets you catch monsters. I used to have one of those on Game Boy, actually. I could never get very far in it, but yeah, it's a novel concept. I think it's cool that they introduced it here, and it certainly gets best pixel nod bonus points for being innovative, but yeah, not some, not totally utilized in terms of how it blends with the story. I want to actually kind of, I feel like something we probably should have said from the start is that the best way to think about this game's story is it's sort of like um, the uncle in The Princess Bride. Giants, monsters, chases, escapes, revenge, true love, miracles. Like, that just like sums up this game because I, I was just thinking about it as you we were talking and going, man, it's like, oh, well, this is the part when you're a slave. This is the part where you go to this fairy kingdom. Oh, yes. In this other sequence, you're saving a prince who's kidnapped. It's like, my goodness, there's, it sounds like there's just so much. And, and it is. It doesn't feel overwhelming or rushed when you play it, though, because you have those long stretches of downtime where you're just, you know, OK, here's a dungeon. And the dungeon context is, well, you're going through a trial to find you know the water ring so that way you can bring it back to this like noble figure so you can be betrothed to his daughter and that's the context for the story and along the way you have Bianca with you who's helping you out and there's this kind of growing sentiment of man this is kind of weird she's helping me like in my life and I feel kind of bad about that but you know she cares about me so much and so you're just left to kind of really think about that right or like uh, after you're a slave and you're going through a cave and you uh, there's like the talk of this monster who's just terrorizing the town and everybody's freaked out. And then you go and confront it and you find it's the little tiger thing that you confronted as a child. And then it recognizes you and you reunite. And so, you know, you lose your friends that gets taken away when you're a slave, but then they come back when you return. Bit of a Count of Monte Cristo. I'm making all these references because it's just one of those stories that just has such a all-encompassing approach and yeah I don't know I just that style really appeals to me I was gonna come up with some non video game examples you know the kind like you know your three hour Titanic narrative or your 500 page Homer's Odyssey but when I was looking for examples I couldn't really find anything that was both exceptionally long and epic while also focusing on childhood and coming of age and I think that's interesting too. There are some out there but nothing I recognize so I can't really speak to their credibility but also it made me realize that maybe long epics featuring youthful protagonists are not something we typically see in the high art landscape. And I mean the closest example I guess you could say is something like Harry Potter but you know now I'm gonna, I'm gonna be bringing this into our best pixel conversation here because Harry Potter is an important piece of literature, but it's not something that does something tremendously new. Not on the same level as, say, Lord of the Rings, or The Odyssey, or like some of these major literary works, right? In fact, Harry Potter is very much a recreation of a lot of sort of classic tales. So there's kind of an interest I have with Dragon Quest, and it feels like it is doing something a lot more than what it initially lets on. I mean, it did inspire a plethora of innovative developments, such as, you know, the monster catching thing that we said. You can get married in it. 
And it's the first game where you actually have a playable pregnant character, for whatever that's worth. So it was definitely, like, taking strides, not just to be, you know, digging its heels in to be, okay, well, let's focus on mechanically mechanical interest. How do we make that more exciting? And instead, it's more like interpersonal themes. They become more relevant. I would also say, you know, now that we're kind of on the subject, that this is something, there is something to be said for honoring the Dragon Quest series as a whole. The original was designed to serve as an entry point for RPGs. Fantasy RPGs at the time were somewhat notorious for how convoluted and off-putting they were. And I'm thinking of stuff like Wizardry or Ultima, these kind of very hard barrier to entry games. People enjoyed them, but really the only people who did were those hardcore fans. Uh, everyone else was left to assume it was something for nerds. While Dragon Quest was and is enormously popular, we've not selected a game from the series at random as an academy. Past Dragon Quest games deserve praise for popularizing RPG gameplay through conscious streamlining and simplification, but 5 puts story depth at the forefront of the experience. The Dragon Quest formula tagging along merely makes the game a one-two punch. You get to experience Dragon Quest pretty much in its welcoming formulaic style, but you also get a surprisingly well-executed story. The two halves work hand-in-hand hand to create what I would consider a pretty quintessential RPG experience. In isolation, the game covers a great deal of achievement, but it does come with some drawbacks that make it feel dated today. Dragon Quest V actually looks older and more dated than it actually is, so it masquerades as something completely forgettable from the time, and it literally looks like a late stage NES title. And the fact that it looks and plays 5 to 10 years older than it should, for me, is a good thing because it captures an authentic transitional moment in RPG history. So okay. I'll, I'll, sure. and I'll, I'll kind of take this one more step further and just kind of talk about its best pixel nomination and the kind of the larger context, and then I'm going to get into that finer points. Um, so it's one other nomination is in for best gameplay fellowship and relaxation. The gameplay is nostalgic, it represents old school gaming, but not very innovative or engaging for the likes of some of us due to the excessive length and repetition. But there is something appealing about mellowing out to a system that demands very little of the player. So this is, you know, our new gameplay category this year and the emphasis on relaxation you can definitely get into that groove where it's nice and easy. Occasionally it ramps up and you got some tension like when you reach a boss. But for the most part, you're just very casually monitoring your health and magic points as you progress through dungeon to dungeon. And like I said, it creates that kind of introspective space that I think is appealing to people who don't want something like the likes of, let's say, Contra. The gameplay itself is fairly relaxing because, you know, you don't need to come up with brand new strategies for most of the guys you fight and a lot of the battles are pretty easy and you got all these cute aesthetics to go along with your battles. But this actually matches the story for large swaths of the game. Um, there's a lot of times where you're going somewhere purposeful, but you don't need to be there right away. And along the way, you're getting to bond with your wife or your children or your cute monsters. And as a result, the relaxing battles will fit reasonably often with what's going on in the story. So that's kind of a nice direction nod there as far as the relaxing gameplay matching with a relaxing story. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I do actually have a con here, just a small one, and that's the AI is really brain dead. So for example, if you tell your squad, okay, just take offensive actions, your healers will still prioritize healing if you reach too low health. This is a nice sentiment, but nearly always we would have just won if you'd outright attacked like I asked. But since they refused to follow my orders and heal, it means they effectively wasted their turn. And if they attacked, the enemy would be dead. Since you didn't, you get hit and you'll simply have to heal again when the battle ends. So it's just kind of an annoying uh, bit of it because if you want it to be relaxing, I want to just be able to give a command and just sit and watch. But I don't know, maybe other people feel differently and they like just the very small bit of activity. I I don't get too engaged with it because it's very much just like select attack and then select attack, select heal. And you kind of just do that at rhythm. There are moments where you get tougher enemies and you have to enter that phase where you go, okay, I need to keep this person alive and I need to keep them alive so that they can revive everyone else if they go down. It's a good balance, I guess, overall. And it's definitely something that is very appealing to a whole lot of folks. 
though I'm not really going to elaborate further because it's not something that Corbett or I are particular experts on, I would say. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, as for its other categories, I did think the music was exceptional enough for a nomination as well. However, it's such a long game, and while there's a good amount of variety, there's not quite enough. Uh, the theme, Deep Underground, I really loved. That's my favorite track. It felt like just the start of this kind of booming adventure, but something in a very kind of dark and quiet way. And I, I, I really liked that contrast and the effect that it created, but at the same time, it plays in nearly every underground dungeon that you go into, and so the fact that it plays so often, and the fact that the music has to restart every time you encounter an enemy, you know, these are things that actively work against it. I actually think this game would have been good if it had certain areas where the music wouldn't change when you encounter an enemy, it would just stay the same, because I think that would have blended nicely with the flow. Yeah, actually, I feel like that's the case for a lot of RPGs, where they'd be better off just letting their ambience continue during the battles, but I guess yeah. it's tradition at this point that your RPGs have to transition to a battle theme when you got a battle. Yep, battle theme must commence. <laughs> yep, actually, uh, one thing I forgot to mention with regards to Fellowship, which I guess also applies to narrative, is... I love the puns in this game. Oh, man. <laughs> like, the pun battle... Like, the enemies frequently have names like Will of the Whips, and it's like a ghostly whip <laughs> character or things like that. I feel bad because I actually lost my phone in the ocean and it deleted all my WhatsApp messages, but, like, there were several mm. times during the game where I was messaging my friends and, like, oh, my gosh, this is so good. I mean, there's one point where, like, I almost feel like this is only slightly to the narrative's detriment, but, like... The section where after you're like a slave and you just endured forever and you finally emerge into this loving church and you're like, what the heck? How am I like, you know, in this beautiful place and stuff like that. And like the game lets you know it's OK because it explains, oh, yes, you're at the order of the above and I am a nun of the above. It's just like, oh my gosh, that's so stupid. I love it. And it's just like a nice way for the game to let you know that like everything's okay again after your life just friggin' sucked for like the last decade or whatever. So yeah, some some very excellent puns in the English translation. Props to the uh, to the translators pulling that off. I imagine they were similar puns in the Japanese version as well. Yeah, yeah, I agreed. There is a, I, I, that's something I, failed to touch upon with the narrative composition discussion is there is a lot of good humor in this throughout and, and also just good character interactions in general like i really like this scene where on the night of your wedding you're supposed to make a decision in the morning and you're not sure who you want to marry and so you're you wake up in the middle of the night and you're just kind of wandering around town just thinking about it and you can go into the inn and there's uh, a woman there and she's like a you know a, a dancer and you talk to her and she's like why does everybody keep wondering about the guy's feelings she has feelings too and then she kind of stops and is like well you seem pretty sweet so i imagine you are thinking about her and you know it doesn't give you a space to respond or say anything back so it's really just up to you as a player to notice that and make that decision for yourself her line about, well, you seem this way, but I don't really know, is kind of indicative of the fact that it's still the player's choice to decide how they feel about these scenarios. And whether that manifests in the game, it's kind of irrelevant to me because it manifests in the player. And that was sort of like one of the arguments I think I wrote on with Castlevania last year, where it doesn't really matter how much Simon had changed by the end, it really just mattered how much the player had changed. And I feel like that's where games need to be focused in terms of their actual, like, aesthetic um, beauty. Sure. I'm not sure if I can add anything on there, but I appreciate you giving your additional takes. Alrighty then. If that's the case, then are you ready to hear a somewhat even longer explanation of this? Because I'm going to go real deep. Oh my, that, I thought that you gave this spiel earlier. I didn't realize no. it wasn't in here yet. Oh my, well then, my body is ready. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you guys the mini essay. I suppose it's not quite essential, 
but I felt like this game was more artistic than it had any business being. And so these, this was kind of like more extended thoughts that I wrote over the course of like an hour. I was sitting in a coffee shop and it just kind of came to me. So I wrote it out. It didn't really fit in the larger script very well. And so I'm just going to read through it straight from top to bottom. And it's mostly applies to narrative composition, direction, and best pixel. So it goes like this. There are countless fantasy RPGs. And fantasy RPGs do not have the making of high art. For one, they are heavily reliant on subpar writing to convey their narratives. And for another, fantasy is frequently questioned for high art validity. Unless you are Lord of the Rings, it's very difficult to be both high art and fantasy at the same time. Lord of the Rings gets a pass because it's an extremely rare story about friendship, forgiveness, and reconciliation with mortality. It is also written with extensive world building and nuanced recreation of historic storytelling that further emphasizes the value of fantasy. In other words, part of the thesis of Lord of the Rings is to uphold the merits of fantasy, and obviously you can't make that kind of claim in a format that is not fantasy itself. My problem with fantasy RPGs is they want to be treated like Lord of the Rings, without demonstrating a justifiable reason for why they must be a fantasy RPG. Dragon Quest V, by what I feel is complete coincidence, earns this because it makes the player a child to comment on childhood. You can't do that if the aesthetic is overly grim or mature. It wants to reminisce on the kind of blissful perspective children have. Children are attracted to vibrant but straightforward colors, characters, and narratives, and so that's what we're left with. The game asks us to remember and recreate our childlike perspective, and all its aesthetic devices are necessities that encourage the player to undergo that transformation. What other fantasy RPGs will do by contrast is introduce a subject like loss or redemption or what have you, because it happens to a character and they tell us this. But this isn't going far enough. Now imagine a story that goes like this. Once upon a time I had a dog, and I loved that dog. And then the dog died and I was sad at the end. Now that's technically a story. It has no plot, but it is a story. But no one would call that high art, not necessarily just because it's lazy, but more so because no one will feel anything from that kind of story. There's no nuance, it doesn't make effective dynamic use of the English language, and it tells us nothing we haven't already contested with ourselves. I'm using that analogy because RPGs need to work harder, I feel. The idea that they are the token child of high art video games is, in my view, a fallacy. Film is an art form because of its ability to convey meaningful narrative and aesthetic nuances via visuals. RPGs, on the other hand, are one part narrative via text and cinematics, and one part gameplay. And in the case of RPGs, the gameplay is vastly inferior and afterthought to the project's vision. And so they have this kind of internal conflict where they stop being what they are to then be something else in order to satisfy the kind of quota that we want to see in a high art piece, that being the story. I call it an afterthought because it does things like you choose attack and then it'll say something like you dealt 116 points of damage. Okay, what does that mean? How much health does the enemy have? Is this a good amount of damage or do I need to rethink my strategy? It may as well just say you dealt the enemy some damage. And Dragon Quest V falls victim to this also, but the difference here is that because it doesn't invent on the formula in any interesting way, and is in fact extremely faithful to this archaic design philosophy, it acts as a time capsule. To make a comparison, there are passages in Lord of the Rings where it's just Tolkien recounting some family lineage, or explaining lore details on some monster we've only just encountered, and these are conscious choices, choices that harken back to writings like Beowulf or Homer. He's writing in a specific style not to reference it, but because they are considered classics. And he's arguing that fantasy can be as virtuous and valuable to us as any other storytelling device. Lord of the Rings is written to emulate a particular set of characteristics that are not very enjoyable to our modern eyes. However, they are necessary in crafting a challenging perspective on what makes a story great. Dragon Quest V is similar here because it basically is because it is basically a streamlined time capsule of the hundreds if not thousands of fantasy games from the decades in and around it. 
You can basically play Dragon Quest V and skip everything else and you'll have a good grasp of what makes a fantasy RPG. Just as you could read Lord of the Rings and arguably skip out on a ton of other fantasy novels. Why? Because those novels are derivative of Lord of the Rings. Dragon Quest V isn't the oldest among them, but it is the one that has a genuinely meaningful comment on the human condition while simultaneously providing an approachable way to expose yourself to a form of game design that has been of high importance in the greater culture of gaming. Now, just to be clear, I don't think Dragon Quest and Lord of the Rings have comparable stories. What they are about is very different, but that's not a criticism. They are both about important topics, so it's fine. I want to also stress that there is one way in which these two are uniquely different. Lord of the Rings streamlines a number of classic writings and then becomes a massive source of inspiration for basically every other fantasy to follow. Dragon Quest V, on the other hand, came out a good half a decade or more after the foundational game classics it's streamlining. It's not a comet from hundreds of years later in which it reorients our perspective on the subject in a new era. Instead, it's a voice that existed and somehow captured the essence of this type of game design with a theme that will always be aesthetically relevant. As art connoisseurs, it can be difficult to correctly identify the exemplary pieces of the medium while we are experiencing them in the present time. This is why sometimes a film like The Sting, a largely forgotten unremarkable heist film from the 70s, compares unfavorably to The Godfather. One is sort of decent but largely obscure, while the other is a tentpole masterpiece in the history of cinema. What they share in common is that they were both made within a year of each other, and they both won Best Picture at the Oscars. The Best Picture winner needs to be the film that most accurately reflects cultural and artistic mindsets, values, and technological advancements from the era they exist. I say all this because Dragon Quest V very much represents that vision. It's unclear how it would have fared in 1992 in a real award context, since it wasn't released in the US until it was remade, and by then the landscape had changed. Its recreated Nintendo DS port was merely an echo of its original creation, and the honors for great RPGs had been given to Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger. If I had to guess, I'd say people would not have paid much consideration to Dragon Quest V. You have more innovative games to talk about. But Dragon Quest V did do something rare and remarkable. It drew the focus of the game experience on reflective questioning such as coming of age, cycles, independence, and growth, and then made these elements of the highest honor. And because it did that, it essentially eliminated any need for gameplay or aesthetic design because those things, like an endearing story, are timeless and need no correction, justification, or explanation. In other words, it was the first game to solidify the claim that RPGs are about growth, are about storytelling, and are about the curious ways in which we receive aesthetic messages. It is not a power fantasy, it is not a strategy, but the gameplay is not exactly an afterthought in the same way that it is in so many other RPGs, including the Dragon Quest games that came before. It is an afterthought to comment and criticize the ways other RPGs have made it an afterthought. You going up levels is told to you mechanically and narratively, and there is no other depth to the system because it means nothing more than that. Whew, still with me? <laughs> I think so. I have some follow-up clarifying questions. You mentioned that Dragon Quest is a time capsule, but like... Does being a time capsule inherently make it high art, or do you have to take that time capsule and, like, use that time capsule to really, like, do something with that time capsule? Because, like, you can make... Contra 3 is also a time capsule. Well, no, not Contra 3. Let me think. What's it? Like, a lot of games of the era are, like, time capsules because they, like, you know, encapsulate a lot of what's good about their previous games and stuff like that. I suppose the other ones aren't as dedicated to being deliberately retro. I mean, mind you, though, retro throwbacks happen nowadays a lot. You know, you got the, you know retro s games like Shovel Knight, which are a time capsule and stuff like that, you know, but like just because Shovel Knight's a retro game, I wouldn't say that it's high art just because it captures retro games. I feel like it has to be in order to be high art. It kind of has to be a time capsule and then use that time capsule to really like say something with that. But I guess um, and you mentioned how it sort of synthesizes with a theme that's timeless. But like, I guess I don't 
like I'm assuming that you're talking about talking about the uh, you know growing up and your story as a life and stuff like that. But like, I guess I don't fully see how that connects with the game being a time capsule. So I guess I'm curious if you can like elaborate yeah. a bit more about that. Yeah. So it's sort of like if someone were to ask me, you know, what, what's a starting place for a video game? I, I don't really have any context for it, especially if they wanted to know about storytelling games or RPGs. And they said, what's the kind of first game that serves as that important entry point, but that's also like an important game to play. I would say just play this because that's going to summarize for you everything else. And it's sort of, I don't want to say it makes games like, you know, Wiz Wizardry or Ultima or Final Fantasy or makes them like irrelevant. It's not really the case. It's just more that it has broader range because Final Fantasy is sort of this new and hip fantasy RPG, even for its time. And you're going to notice that right away when you start playing it. Versus if you played Dragon Quest, you're going to get this, you, you almost get hit in the face and you go, what is this? Why does everything feel so archaic and slow and restrictive? And that's because it's doing things deliberately because it's doing them in the way that everybody older than it was doing. It just also happens to have streamlined that process. I mean, that was the original concept of Dragon Quest in the first place, was <clears throat> to take all of these fantasy games, of which there were like hundreds and hundreds of them, and, you know, most of them are very bare bones, most of them are very mechanical oriented, most of them are very off-putting, and it sort of made it an approachable gameplay style. The problem with the past Dragon Quest games is that they weren't about a story that was particularly meaningful. And this one is, but it's also in a scenario where it doesn't need to be so uh, reluctant to change. And so as a result, it sort of makes a comment on that. It's innovative only in the specific area in which it matters, which is the story. Video games need to be about stories. They can be these big, grand stories, and they can also be things that bring the player into that experience. And that message comes through because it doesn't tamper with anything else. As soon as you start touching everything else, then I start factoring those elements in more specifically. And so does that kind of make a little more sense? Okay, so if I'm understanding you correctly, the reason why it being a time capsule is used for artistic effect is that the unchanging nature of the gameplay allows more emphasis to be played on the things that are differently which is the story that being said yes. though it's like they do also have the monster catching that was added in which you know i don't yeah. know if that was meant to be as emphasized as it is but maybe that was just done for the sake of like um what's the word making the the game flow better because i mean if they didn't it might be that they had sections in the game where they're like okay narratively we want you to be on your own and the game would be totally unbalanced gameplay wise if you had a bunch of party members. So let's give them monsters to fit in, you know, fill in the party members. Because, I mean, yeah. even though they do have the, you know, that is a pretty big gameplay deviation. But it also, it is. because it doesn't get a lot of emphasis on the narrative and stuff like that. Maybe that was one of those things that they just threw in there more as a quality of life change. More so than really being the thing they're trying to, like, draw super high amounts of attention to, perhaps. I'm not sure. But the story, the story yeah. definitely is a big difference from, from before. And they do try to bring emphasis to that so so yeah okay okay i could kind of see that as far as the paired back unchanging time capsuleness allowing the narrative to really pop a bit more hmm interesting. yeah interesting and yeah specifically because just so i mean with the exception of like final fantasy because final fantasy is very conscious about its story as well um, a very different type of storytelling because it's sort of like a D and D campaign with a bunch of, like, I don't want to say random, but it it very much likes to go on side quests and do all sorts of things that are not immediately obvious where how they're going to relate. Whereas Dragon Quest is very much like there's Act One, Act Two, Act Three, and here's like the through line of all that and how it narratively fits together. So it's much more well, it's funny. structured. It it's funny you say that because in the remake for the Nintendo DS. They do give you this fairly elaborate mini game of the bomb maze, I think it's called, where you have this uh -huh. giant board game at random points in the game. And like by traversing it and landing on different spots, you fight monsters and you collect prizes and things like that. But like totally unrelated to the narrative. So 
but that was in the remaster, well, so I, I shouldn't hold it against the original, but that would be, I guess, an example where, you know, it, they are adding in some fluff. Although, what about the casino? Well, Did they well, have the casino? I was casino? about to say... So yeah, so they do have the casino in this one. So you, it's not that you can't it, you can't have things that are on the sidelines, but like, you know, side questing is fine. It's just that the casino is entirely optional. You don't need to do anything with the casino. You're right to point out the sort of monster catching thing, which to me, I, it didn't strike me as particularly innovative to experience. It was just like, oh, that's a novel thing. And you know, the Pokemon one is where it like really starts to get exciting. So it's entirely possible that they weren't even thinking about it in terms of how innovative it was, and it was just like you said, just some kind of like, ah, right, well, let's give a, this mechanic to it. That sort of makes logistical sense, and is a way for us to make sure there's always party members in them. With let's move on, and you know, without really recognizing as like trying to push something. So I don't know that one. That one you can contest with the theses for sure, but everything else only pertains to the Super Nintendo version. All the remakes, all the remasters, just chuck that stuff out. Um, I don't think, I, I don't actually recommend them. And in fact, this is the only game where I feel so strongly that you should, if you're going to play it, just play this version. Just get an English patch and play through it this way. Because if you go through it in another way, I feel like it was the fact that I had experienced, you know, the Dragon Warrior in the monotony of that game. And, you know, I say other games... And it's hard to even pin them down because they're just forgotten about. Stuff like Opidus or, um, gosh, what were or, um, Draken. You know, some of those games are just enormously difficult to just try and absorb and appreciate. And sometimes there's a heart of gold in there and sometimes there isn't. Usually there isn't. And so this being a game that is in some ways like that, it's like a you know, a playthrough of Opetus in the sense where, oh, this is clunky and difficult and just kind of like bare bones. And so that's why I think it's so impressive is the fact that it is reminiscent of the time of what it was like to play a game at that time. Whereas like you look at Contra 3 and that game is just dressing to impress. That game looks like it could have come out yesterday and it would basically be pretty much the same. I mean, there'd be a few changes, but for the most part, it just holds up. And so Dragon Quest doesn't hold up. But it, instead, it's giving us a window into a pocket in time, and a big window at that. It sort of is this very great entry point to start talking about this entire push, uh, or this entire industry trend of trying to create these fantasy adventures. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from there, because, I mean, if you play one of the remakes or the remasters, it doesn't function as well as a time capsule of something that's being deliberately like the same as really old games and stuff like that, you know? And that mm -hmm. sort of changes a number of things and whatnot. I mean, for one, yeah. like, you know, you don't have the as much of an emphasis on, you know, the story is the only thing that's different. Um, and you also don't give the game quite as much of a pass for all of its rough quality of life stuff because, you know, the presentation makes it look like, oh, I'm trying to be a new game that's competing with all the modern guys, but like, you right. know, um, but if you're judging it as a modern game, then you're like, well, okay, then why is this dungeon lasting freaking forever? And, you know, right. stuff like that. So Right, and then you miss yeah. the point that in the time, that was so commonplace. And so here, yeah, maybe it's a, a dungeon that's too long, but also that sort of gives you a snapshot of what a lot of those games were like back in the day. It, and I feel so strong with that just because I've sampled so many just throughout my whole life. I've just played so many of these really archaic games and I lose interest quickly and it kind of falls apart and I'm like, okay, I'm not that compelled to continue with it because it just, there's so much like uh, work and imagination I have to do on my part. And, you know, even stuff like Shining in the Darkness, like I enjoyed that game last year but, you know, I can only get so far, and then I'm like, okay, like, I'm burning out of steam. And that happened with me in this one, too, but I wasn't actually burnt out. I just stopped because I wanted a breather, and I felt content with where I was at with the game, and I liked the idea of revisiting it after a period of time. And so I was kind of like, and I, and I did read through, you know, the script afterwards uh, to kind of catch up on some of the story beats that happen. And, you know, I don't know if I'll ever finish it just because, like, 
yeah, I don't know if I want to struggle through the part of the game where it really is going to hammer home that message of how well it represents these other archaic uh, elements. But I think even if you just played like a good half of it, you'd probably feel pretty comfortable with that as a foray into an entire history and of the genre of games. Sure. Yeah, I would say that for those who are, you know, trying to figure out which version to play, I think that Midge's talk, you know, presents a reasonable argument as far as why you should play the original with a fan translation. Um, that being said, the DS version did, aside from the mini game with the board game and whatnot, um, it did add party talk where everyone in your party will have context sensitive dialogue such that like you talk to an NPC and then everyone will say something about that interaction and such. So there is a lot of extra story for that reason. It's probably like double the original length in terms of script, but I don't know for me, at least like, you know, the party talk was neat and it added some flavor, but like, I wouldn't say that any of it was like essential viewing where I felt like the game experience would be incomplete if I didn't have this, you know, party talk flavor text and whatnot. So, so I would say despite the addition of party talk, um, it's reasonable if you want to just play the original SNES game, you know, just to give you an idea yeah. of the main difference between the two. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the Dragon Quest reputation is now very much secure, but I think more at the time that that and that's another thing that just it's it's interesting that this game was never released into the US until 2009. Like, that's so much later. What is that? Almost, like, 15 years, something like that? To 2009. 2009, so it's 17 years. Yeah, so it's a 17 years before we actually get to experience it here in the West. At least in a real tangible context, the game garners a reputation for itself. And, of course, the Dragon Quest series has done very well for itself since then. But this is kind of the one that I think really stands out among the pack. Um... You know, and just and just again, when I think of the other games that I played for this season or last season or just throughout childhood, um, stuff like Paladin's Quest is like, all right, you're a kid in a small town, but then you destroy, you end up making a mistake, and that destroys the town, and then you start going on an adventure, and it's just like, I'm sure there's a great game buried underneath here, but I'm just I'm not able to access that. Uh, same with like uh, Lufia and the Fortress of Doom. Same with just so many other games. And this one just didn't do any of that, but it wasn't visually impressive. It wasn't mechanically impressive in any way. But instead, the story was just so sincere. And it just zeroes in on saying, hey, you are this character. This is your journey, your quest. And that means you're going to be starting off as a blank slate protagonist. And you're so blank slate that you're just six years old. And then it starts recreating scenarios that a six-year-old would partake in and that would be interesting to them and you know this is just it's such a human game i felt like it was truly exceptional among others in its series but also among the genre and just among games in a larger context because you know it's easy to overlook and dismiss it's easy to just take one glance at the game and think okay well nothing has changed since the last dragon quest game when really everything has changed, but none of it has been the things that you would initially think to improve because they get at the heart of the matter, the stuff that actually means something for people. And that's what's so special about it. Sure. I'd say that's uh, understandable as far as some of the reasons that you think it's best pixel worthy. Well, I think I'm... I think I've dragged everybody through way too much by this point, so I'm ready to call it good. Do you have any final uh, comments for Dragon Quest V? But I don't think so. Alrighty then. Well, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Corbett, for hashing it out with me and for listening to my very, very long extended thoughts. <laughs> yeah, no problem. That's part of why it's nice to have an English major on our uh, writing team. Fair enough. It might also just have been... I don't know. I don't want to criticize the the games this season because I do like them. I do think we have a great bunch, but it was something of a drought. And I think that's self-evident by the fact that nothing got more than eight nominations. There was no game that 
was really captivating my attention. The closest one was probably this one, and so I think all my creative outlet just got poured into it. Uh, hopefully that was justified, or maybe I'm just crazy, and then you guys can respond with like, what are you talking about? It's just Dragon Quest. It's not that interesting. <laughs> But I guess we will have to see what the voters think. Oh, I don't know anything about uh, getting captivated creatively by something and having a script that goes on way too long. <laughs> oh, no, not not me. No, sir. <laughs> yeah, you're immune. You're immune to that problem, I would say. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, boy. I'll have to make sure this episode comes out after uh, Rondo of Blood and uh, Star Control 2. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us. And if Dragon Quest V wins Best Pixel, it will illuminate the need for childhood memories and represent a window into a decade of fantasy gaming history.